in the morning, 20th October 1962. A heavy barrage of artillery and water fire broke the silence of the mountains in Arunachal. 3,000 kilometers away, at the western end of the India-China border, Chinese guns roared as well. The war which everyone knew was coming, but still thought would never happen, had begun. The roots of the 1962 India-China war go back to 1950. China invaded Tibet and captured that peaceful Shangri-La. That annexation made India and China neighbors for the first time. It was only Sardar Patel who realized its implications and warned, China is not a friend, but a long-term adversary. Sadly, that wisdom was lost and instead, India followed a policy of appeasement towards China, condoning its actions, even supporting it in international forums. It was not long before disquiet set in. China did not accept the existing India-Tibet border and instead claimed all of Arunachal Pradesh, then called Nefa, and around 30,000 kilometers of Ladakh. It also began building the G219 National Highway, running through Aksai Chin, Indian Territory. India remained blissfully unaware of the road till its completion was announced in October 1957. As the claims intensified, border clashes began. Indian patrols were ambushed, killed and captured. To buttress our claims, the Indian government decided to adopt a forward policy. Operation Onkar as they called it. This policy involved establishing posts bang on the border to lay stake to our claims. The brainchild of Prime Minister Nehru and the Defence Minister VP and Menon, this policy was pushed through in spite of objections from the army. Both sides began establishing posts to counter the other and a dangerous game of I dare began. Faced with severe internal problems of their own, China decided to up the ante and built up 54th Army in Tibet for a coming offensive. Yet, even as military preparations were underway, the Chinese Premier Chao Lai made a week-long visit to India to lull us into a spirit of hindi Chini bhai bhai as they secretly prepared for their offensive. In June 1962, the pot was close to boiling. Chinese troops surrounded a post in Galwan and a tense standoff took place. In September, a newly established post, Dhola Post in Arunachal Pradesh, was surrounded by threatening Chinese troops. They occupied positions behind it on the Thagla Ridge inside Indian territory. Additional Indian troops, 7th Brigade, was moved to counter the Chinese ingress. The flashpoint was approaching and on 20th October, Chinese troops launched the offensive in both Ladakh and Nefa. The war had begun. 
the first action of the war was against 7th infantry brigade which had been hastily inducted to counter the chinese moves near thagla ridge its battalions were strung along the low lying namkachu valley dominated by the chinese the brigade had marched in over 3 days just to reach the area its men were vomiting blood due to lack of acclimatization they carried only pouch ammunition had no mines or defense stores no artillery or even the basic supplies wrongly deployed at the floor of a valley the brigade was cut off surrounded and virtually decimated in just the first few hours of battle the battle of namkachu unfortunately set the trend for the rest of the campaign the chinese launched their main attack towards tawang in spite of a gallant delaying action chinese troops infiltrated behind the tawang defenses tawang was well stocked and prepared it could have held on but a spirit of panic overcame the senior leadership troops were ordered to abandon it and withdraw to positions in the rear tawang fell on the 23rd of october and then the chinese paused to develop a road for their supplies there was a lull of over a fortnight which gave the indian time to induct more troops in the area but the soldiers who came in were from the plains unacclimatized to fighting in the altitudes their temperatures dropped to minus 20 degrees and your bare hand froze on metal they were in summer uniforms held antiquated 303 rifles in hand the automatic rifles had come without ammunition they had never seen the area they dug fox holes in the frozen earth with mess tins they carried little with them but courage and spirit on 17th november the chinese launched the next phase of the offensive with two crack divisions on the indian position at sela sela was have been held as a fortress it was well stocked and defended once again the chinese infiltrated behind the indian positions once again panic was created in the senior leadership and once again indian troops were ordered to abandon their position and move back to bomdila and dirong as indian troops withdrew they were ambushed by the chinese who had infiltrated and established roadblocks behind them the battle took place repeatedly at each location the withdrawal turned into a rout and one by one the defenses crumbled virtually all the way till the foothills of assam finally on 20th november the chinese announced a unilateral ceasefire and then withdrew back to their original locations ladakh in the western sector is even more important to china it provides depth to aksai chin and the crucial road passing through it on 20th october they attacked in conjunction with the offensive in the east in just 3 days they had captured most of a forward post they then prepared for the next phase of the operations the capture of chushul and its vital airfield the chinese attack was expected to come through the spangur gap a 40 km wide flat area leading to chushul 
When the Chinese attacked on 18th November, they hit both flanks of the gap. The northern flank held on for over 30 hours before falling. In the south, at Rizangla, 128 men of C Company 13 Kumau fought till the end, fighting virtually to the last man and the last drop. When the guns finally fell silent on 20th November 1962, Chushul still remained in Indian hands. And fortunately so, because though the Chinese withdrew from the eastern sector, in Ladakh, they held on to the areas they had captured. What went wrong in that war? Everything. The intelligence failed. The political leadership failed. The military leadership failed by not being better prepared for the war. There were no roads, no infrastructure, no logistic support. Even the Indian Air Force, which could have tilted the scales, was not called on to play. It was a series of military and political blunders that led to a disaster of Himalayan proportions. In 2020, the Chinese specter arises on our northern borders. But this is not 1962. The Indian Army of today is not the Army of 1962. It is a battle hardened, well trained, and among the world's best in mountain warfare. Much needed infrastructure has been developed there. And yes, there is a welcome decisiveness, both at the political and the military level. 2020 is not 1962. It is a different ball game now. But irrespective of what follows, we must never forget the lessons of 1962. Not now, not ever.